Well, hey, it's uh, January 10th, 10, year, 10, 10 days into the new year, and uh, how's it going? How are those resolutions going? You know, you can't break them if you don't make them, okay? All right. I'm just saying, okay? All right. All right, well, listen, uh, New Year's, uh, at least for me, is a time of uh, reflection, first uh, week or two of, of the new year, and we're still within that time frame. Uh, I, I think it's also that way for many people. You're thinking back on the year before, and, and then you begin to think ahead to the new year, and that's anticipation, sometimes mixed with apprehension, okay? Where uh, you're thinking of what, what is in store for me this year, what are my plans, what are my resolutions, uh, and, and I think, you know, for me, I'm, I'm more on the reflective side, and so I wanted to speak on something this morning that, that I've been reflecting on for quite some time, and I know a number of people here at Covenant have as well, and I think it's something that not only deserves our reflection, uh, but our prayers, and, our, and in many cases, our, our action, okay, because oftentimes a response is required. Um, and I think that anyone who's paying much attention uh, to what's happening in our world and in the church uh, uh, countrywide uh, knows that there's something going on, and that's really the topic of my sermon, is why young adult Christians walk up. Check, check. Should I try it again? <laughs> uh, why young adult Christians walk away and what our sh response should be to them. Um, you know, when I say walk away, I oftentimes what I'm saying is try to walk away, and I'll, I'll make that more clear uh, as we go along. It's, it's not a new trend. Uh, every generation has, has, its, has had its spiritual challenges, but it is a uh, more frequent and growing trend. Uh, we good? Okay. All right. <clears throat> I might need three hands now. We'll see how it goes, okay? All right. All uh, right. And so the, so the frequency and the numbers um, that are, of which it's happening are, are getting uh, alarming. And, and the truth is it's, it's happening to more and more families. And it's happening to families right here who have young adult um, Christians who are walking away from the faith. And it's affected many of us right here. Um, and one of the more confusing aspects of this is when you look, and trust me, I've looked, uh, across the board at these young adults, uh, oftentimes there seems to be no rhyme or reason as to why it's happening and what is happening because in some cases you'll look at a young adult Christian and on a human level and circumstantially and based on what they've experienced in their young life so far, they have every reason not to be pursuing their walk with God and yet they are. And on the flip side of that, you'll see young adult Christians who have been given every advantage, okay, in, for someone to want and desire to walk with God, and yet they are not. They're walking away. And that only adds to the pain and the anguish of those who love them, particularly those who uh, care most deeply, which would be their parents. Now, this is a wide-ranging subject, um, and it, my focus this morning is necessarily going to be narrow, for several reasons. One, because of time. Uh, two, because I'm going to tell you what I know. Okay? So that limits it, right? So, because there's a lot that I don't know and I don't understand. Uh, and finally, uh, it's, it's going to be narrow in its focus because I'm going to focus on the individual, which is more what I do. Uh, I'm not going to focus so much on the culture or the church or church wide issues or even the generational issues. I'm going to focus on more on the individual heart. Uh, and my thought is, the more we understand, uh, the more wisdom hopefully we can gain, the more informed our prayers and responses will be to these young adults uh, who are walking away or trying to walk away from the faith. And actually, um, and actually the, the catalyst for this talk, the, kind of the last straw, if you will, is I was talking to one of the young guys that I meet with on a regular basis, and this is maybe six, seven, eight weeks ago, he said, Ron, What's going on? He said, you know, I'm seeing friends, I'm seeing acquaintances that are twisting off from God in very serious ways. What is happening to my generation? And so we had a long talk on that subject, and out of that talk, I had this sense of uh, compelling need just simply to address that 
uh, for us as a body and for, for many people here who are experiencing that kind of pain. Uh, so this is a serious topic. Uh, it's going to be discouraging up front, I warn you, and going to be encouraging on the back end, okay? So don't, so don't check out on me, okay? Uh, but it is serious, so we need to pray. So let me, let me pray for myself and for you and our, our time here together. Father, just uh, lift this time up to you. Thank you for your spirit, Lord, uh, being the one who does the teaching and the one who pierces hearts, the one who gives knowledge and understanding, the one who gives direction and help and encouragement and hope. And Lord, we need all those things. And as I speak here this morning, Father, just uh, give grace to me and to my tongue and help me to remember the things you've shown me, help me to be articulate, help me to say things that you want me to say, and if there's things that I had in mind to say that you don't want me to say, just, just take them away and fill me with your mighty spirit, Father. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now I'm going to the three-handed thing here. Oh. Okay. How's that sound? All right. And again, I'm still on a journey to make myself talk louder, okay, as I get older, all right? <laughs> a very difficult thing. All right. First thing I want to talk, say is when it comes to the mind and heart of a human being, there is mystery. Uh, Psalm 64, 6 says this, the inward thought and heart of a man are deep. Um, Proverbs 25 says, the plans of a man's heart are like deep water. That's a picture of something that's difficult to access. Think of a deep lake or even the ocean, how difficult it is to get to the bottom of that and find out what's there. Sometimes the word deep is used as uh, uh, replacement words are mysterious, unsearchable. Okay, so when we're talking about human beings and we're talking about their mind and their heart, there is mystery there, and there's mystery in the sense that not only do we not understand, we have trouble understanding another person's mind and heart, we have trouble understanding our own mind and heart. And that brings us to Jeremiah 17, 9, that famously proclaims that the heart is deceitful above all else. Apart from God's renewing, redemptive work in us, our hearts are deceitful, and by deceitful, it means not only do we fool other people, we fool ourselves. But the good news is that that, that passage goes on, uh, and it says that in Jeremiah 17, 10, it says that God is the one who searches the hearts and the minds of every human being. Okay, so even though there's things that, that we don't understand about what's happening, in this case, in, in young adult believers who may be your children, and maybe they don't fully understand what's happening. God is not at a loss. He understands exactly what's going on and he searches those hearts and he tests those minds. And by the way, when, God, when the, you see the scripture saying, I search the hearts, the, it's not saying that God is searching our hearts trying to figure out what's going on. It's saying he's searching our hearts in order to reveal what's going on to us, all right? He is never at a loss at what's going on in our hearts. So he searches our hearts, he tests the heart, he tests the mind, and then he shows us what's actually going on there and then is our opportunity to respond or not uh, positively to him. I think of David when he was um, getting Solomon ready uh, to take the throne. He said, the Lord searches all, under, all, th all hearts and understands the intent of every thought, okay? And so I want you to keep that in mind because that's the background of everything I'm gonna say here the, this morning, all right? So what we're gonna do, we're gonna look at five reasons why young adult Christians walk away, or for that matter, any Christian uh, walks away. Uh, it's not a complete list, I'm gonna briefly explore them, and then we're gonna talk about how we should respond to them, okay, in order to help them, and in many cases, help ourselves. So you ready? All right, the first one is disappointment with God. Uh, no one has higher expectations of life on this earth than Americans, okay? It's not just because we're rich and affluent. That's part of it, but it goes all the way back to the Declaration of Independence. It's right there in the DNA of our country, the pursuit of happiness. We have this expectation that life can and should be happy. And the fact that we are affluent and we live in a self uh, realization, personal fulfillment culture that 
has money and comfort and has the freedom and the resources to pursue happiness with everything we've got, that only makes it worse. But in reality, that belief system uh, is a denial of reality. Because this world, if you notice, is not defined by happiness. It, it, it really isn't. Um, I think of Timothy Keller, and just kind of paraphrase some of his comments. He says, the pain and the evil we find in the world are pervasive, they're deep, and they have spiritual roots in our own heart. All we have to do is turn on the TV, check the internet, look at the newspaper, whatever it is you look at, and you see pain, and you see unhappiness. And then you look in your own heart, and you see the struggle of what's going on inside so often. And yet we cling to this belief that not only happiness is possible, it's something that I deserve. And then there's the other problem. You notice everything dies? Everything and everyone dies. That's not happy. That's not happy at all. So even if you do achieve some level of happiness apart from God, it's going to end badly because death is ugly and it comes to each one of us and to every living thing. So that's where we are. And then you add to that this inordinate self-confidence that we have in our own rational faculties, all right? You notice I'm saying we, it's not them, it's us, okay? And this younger generation, they just have more to deal with than the rest of us, but we all deal with the same things. And here's how it works. If we can't see a good reason for God doing or not doing something, then there is no good reason. And that's, that's how we are. That's what we struggle with all the time in our American Western culture. We're overconfident, we're proud, and we get deeply disappointed when God doesn't do what we want him to do. And it's, you know, and it's not something to, to despise in another person or in ourselves because it is deeply painful. It is real pain. It's not imaginary pain, and it's real confusion. When God doesn't seem like he cares, or worse yet, that he's not good or even powerful, or maybe he's not even there because happiness is not going well, and God's not cooperating with me. So maybe, maybe I'll go somewhere else. Maybe I'll find happiness some other way, uh, some other source. So we get deeply disappointed in a God that is not there for us in the way that we think he should, that he should be. So that's the first one, disappointment with God. That's a big category. The second one is unresolved personal pain, which is part of disappointment in God, but it's also a separate category. It's having lunch, excuse me, breakfast with Jim Webb, a few months ago, we do that every once in a while. We're just talking about how the pain of life will find you. And it finds some people early, it finds some people late, but it finds all of us. And the question is, what are we going to do with that pain? Well, young adult believers are encountering more pain at a young age, I believe, than any generation of Americans that have lived before them. And part of that is the culture that, that we live in. And pain, this pain comes to them and comes to us in our inner life and in our outer life. Our inner life, it comes to us by way of sometimes fear and anxiety. Other times it's depression or obsessions and addictions. Uh, it can be emptiness, loneliness, grief, or what you might just refer to as psychic pain, kind of the unrelenting pain of your existence that exists in some people. In our outer life, it comes just by, by way of relationships, circumstances, uh, outward kind of thing, and losses that come to us from, from outside and then serve to contribute to our inner pain. And oftentimes, these, these outer uh, circumstances and pain and losses come to us out of left field. We never saw them coming. And when they hit us, we feel like our life will never be the same. And when we can't somehow make it better. And this is especially true of young people in particular who have a sensitive spirit. And as parents, if you have a child who has a sensitive spirit, it's, it's especially important to pay close attention to that. Because when you have a sensitive spirit, that's a gift and a curse. It's a gift in the sense that you can see things and feel things and understand things and do things that other people can't see, feel, understand, and do. That's the gift part. The curse part is 
you can hurt about things that other people don't hurt about. And you can hurt more deeply than other people hurt. And so unresolved pain becomes a major, major issue between you and God. So be a student of any young person that you're dealing with or concerned about. Be a student of your own son or daughter in that way. It's very, it's very important. And the thing is this, so often it does not occur to us that this pain that comes to us and maybe coming to them might take us somewhere that's significant enough, that's worthy enough, that's eternal enough to make it worth our while to stick with God. And instead, oftentimes what happens is we run from the only one who can resolve unresolved pain, and that is God. That's the second category. Still with me? All right. The third one is willful ignorance. And uh, surprisingly, this is a surprisingly large category, and you know where you see it most? <laughs> In intelligent, educated people. Very ironic, okay? Uh, it, it works like this. Um, it, it presents itself as an intellectual issue, and intellectual issues are legitimate, starting with pain and suffering in the world, moving to issues of fairness and justice, and moving to issues the, to the reliability of Scripture and the veracity of the gospel. All those things are, are intellectual issues that are legitimate in the sense that if you're struggling with those, you need to pursue answers. The problem is, willful ignorance presents that way but that's not really what it is. I, I, I have had many conversations with young people and they've, they've began to tell me their, their issues and I'll say, well, uh, and why? They think that God's got it wrong and the scriptures aren't true and, and I'm done here. Uh, and you ask them, so, well, okay, so who and what have you read? Have you read uh, any C.S. Lewis? Read Niaz Guinness? Um, maybe Timothy Keller? Maybe some of Lee Strobel's work? maybe Dallas Willard, any number of brilliant Christians who have written on whatever subject you may be struggling with, and oftentimes the answer is no. Have you talked to another believer who has navigated the treacherous waters you find yourself in? And oftentimes, not always, okay? But oftentimes, I would actually say most of the time, the answer is no, and that's fine. But then the offer is made, well, hey, I've got something for you to read. You want to do it together? No. Really? Okay, what that is, that's not an intellectual issue. Okay, that is willful ignorance because intellectual issues demand a search for truth. If you're really struggling with those issues, you must know the truth. And a truth seeker seeks to understand both sides of the argument and understands, try to get first-hand knowledge, not shallow second-hand knowledge told to you by someone else that you've just taken it by their word that that's true, okay? Uh, Aldous Huxley, he wrote Brave New World. You might have read that in high school or college. I might have. I don't know if I did or not. He's a famous author from the 20th century. He wrote Brave New World, which is kind of one of the, one of the more famous novels of the early 20th century in the, in the 30s. I, I, I'm not an expert, obviously, on, on Aldous Huxley, but I read a quote by him a number of years ago and he was, was not a believer, but this is, this is brilliant because what it was, it was a self-confession and an analysis of our culture at the time. He said this, he said, we don't know because we don't wanna know. It is our will that decides how and upon what subjects we will use our intelligence. We don't know because we don't wanna know. So. If something's presenting as intellectual issues and yet there's no pursuit of truth, there's something more visceral going on, more in your gut, okay? And I, there's a number of things that can be. The first one on the list is simply the desire to be free of all, restraint, all restraints, all moral authority, and all accountability. That's hard to admit, and people usually don't. But that's usually one of the more visceral reasons for doubting on an intellectual level is because I don't want this, I don't want to answer this. Another one is a kind of a strange one. It's, it's a legalistic uh, take on Christianity. Now, I used to think that in order to grow up with a legalistic take 
on Christianity and the Bible, you need to grow up in a legalistic family and a legalistic church. That's, that's true, you can do that, and that's the one we're more familiar with, that scenario. But there's another scenario. It's this, that we are all born legalists. We all gravitate to law. We all resist grace as unbelievers and as believers. God has to continually work on us and in us to convince us of this great grace and power that works transformatively in us to transform our inner life and our outer life. We resist that. And oftentimes what you'll find in a young believer is they have adopted a resist, a, a legalistic kind of resistance to Christianity and you can see the way they define it. They see it as a list of do's and don'ts. They see it as, as a performance-oriented thing. They see God is not what he is. And, and what is that? That's, that comes from within in spite, in many cases, of the best efforts of their family, their friends, and their church, all right? So those are just two of the more visceral reasons that fuels willful ignorance. I'm ignorant, not because I'm an ignorant person, but I want to be ignorant on this, okay? I do not want to use my intelligence here. Does that make sense? Okay, you see that a lot. It's very frustrating to deal with. The fourth one is no experience of the reality of God. And this is especially difficult for young believers because they're young. They haven't been on this life that long. They have, they have limited number of experiences where they could have encountered and experienced God. And, it, and also, it sounds strange, and don't throw stones at me, but oftentimes, a, a young person who's struggling with this or even an older person who's struggling with this, it, sometimes the root of it is they were raised in a Christian home and a Christian church. Now, just hold it a second, okay? Here's, here's how it works. It's like familiarity breeds contempt. You can be so close to something that is so precious and so right and so true, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God and God himself, but you can be so close to it, so familiar with it, that you begin to take it for granted, and then you begin to lose respect for it, and then it begins to lose meaning. It's kind of like, yeah, Jesus died for my sins, blah, blah, blah. Okay? I was there. When I was 18, that's where I was, right? I didn't disbelieve it, but it's like, yeah, whatever. C.S. Lewis talked about, in one of his books, he said that he was always glad I think, I think this, I know, I think I'm quoting him right. He came to Christ, you know, he was an atheist. He came to Christ in his early 30s. He wasn't raised in the church. And he said he was always glad in some ways that he's had limited contact with holy things. And, and that most of all, he was never called into vocational ministry, but remained a professor of English literature. Because he said, the more, the closer you are, the more you handle holy things, the more in danger you are of having your hands cauterized and therefore your heart cauterized so that you can't feel it anymore. You can't experience the reality of it anymore. That can happen to young believers growing up in the church, all right? And here's the thing. How does God break through that? Typically, he breaks through it through adversity. He brings adversity into a young person's life because it's like, you want a real encounter with me? You want to find out what real life is and what, what a real, how a real God works and, and acts? then I will allow adversity to come to you so you can experience the reality of an amazing, powerful, loving, wise God. And at that point, oftentimes the mistake is made that we resent God for the very adversity he allows to come in to reveal himself to us, and we run from him, right? And that's not just young people. That's all of us, right? So that's another one. No experience uh, of the reality of God. And, and here is God going to break into our sheltered, insulated little Christian world through adversity, and then we, we run, right? And we're supposed to run to him and not from him. The last thing is the world system we live in every day. Let me define the world system for you. It's a system of thought, word, and deed that exists completely apart from the wisdom and will of God. It is utterly opposed to him. It's fueled by the enemy and by our own fallen condition of sin and rebellion. Now, that sounds really ugly, and it is, but as you know, it doesn't present that way. It presents itself as attractive, beautiful, eminently reasonable. All the smart people believe it and do it. Um, and it's powerful. It's very powerful and extremely winsome. And it appeals to and validates all of our appetites and all of our desires. 
in our deeply ingrained willfulness. It's, it's, it's 1 John 2, 15 to 17, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. The world system has been in place ever since Adam and Eve fell and sin came into the world, right? Every culture has a world system belief. It varies. At the core, it's all the same, but it varies. Here in Western culture, it looks a certain way. The thing about here is, and now in the 21st century, is the power of media and the, and the omnipresence of it. It is with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And who's most immersed in media and technology? The younger you are, typically the more immersed you are. Who's being the most deeply affected by the world system through media and technology? Younger people. Their challenge is greater than any other challenge has presented itself to any other generation, I believe, regarding the power of the world system, okay? So it comes in, it's a, it's a, what you call a, I call it a, a beautiful poison, right? It looks beautiful, you drink it, it even tastes good, and, uh, and slowly but surely it takes away what I'd say, everything that's true and everything that's precious, and it makes you like it, and it makes you think it's your idea. Um, it's a very, very difficult challenge that our young people have. So those are the five areas that I see working in individual believers, particularly young believers, that end up convincing them that they need to try to walk away from God and find a new way, find their own way, where they can find a life that is happy and fulfilling and meaningful. That's what's happening on an individual level. And that's not a complete list, that's just my top five, okay? Now, that's the depressing part. Still, still with me here? All right, good, okay. Here, now we wanna shift gears to, okay, how do we respond? Okay, I, and I think the answer to that is, is answering two questions. One is, what do they need? And then what do you need? particularly if you're a parent of a young adult believer who's trying to walk away, right? All right, so first let's talk about what they need. Uh, there's six things they need, if I remember counting right. Uh, first of all, they need love and acceptance. Now that sounds really easy until somebody you love starts attacking and rejecting the, the belief that you hold most dear. You'll find out how loving and accepting you are. And you'll find out that the first order of business is God has to do a work of grace in you and me so that we can give away grace and love and acceptance to them in their state of darkness and rebellion. And that's a major work many times. So oftentimes you're going, God, fix this kid, fix this kid. And God's going, well, how about we start with you? Let's fix you. And let's go deeper into your heart and your mind. And then, well, let's take a look at your kid. That's kind of how God works, very disturbing, okay? Um, so so when, we go, when we set about communicating love and acceptance, I, I think first of all, we have to communicate love in a, in a way that they understand it. So that means you have to go back to what you know about this person or this child of yours, right? And remember, love consists, I think, of words, touch, attitudes, and action. Words, as in continuing to say, I love you. Touch, as in continuing to hug them, uh, touch them. Uh, attitude in the sense of how you approach them, actions in the sense of what you do, okay, in response to their, their difficulty. And remember, love always initiates and it never gives up. First Corinthians 13, love never fails. It, love keeps on coming and keeps on coming and keeps on coming and moving toward the person wisely, carefully, but keeps moving forward, right? It doesn't, the t great temptation is to pull back and, you know, rejection comes in many forms. And sometimes it comes in body language. Sometimes it comes in lack of contact, okay? Keep initiating contact on whatever level you found to be safe, right? That's the first thing, love and acceptance. Because that, without love and acceptance, people don't listen. Have you noticed that? You ever tried to convince somebody of something and you didn't, and you didn't think they liked you? <laughs> I'm not listening to you. You don't even like me, okay? Love and acceptance starts, it starts with that, okay? The second thing is honest communication. And that starts with the goal of listening, not refute, refuting or waiting to talk. Um, 
if the, if the reasons I've talked about, the five reasons why young adults walk away, if those are true, then what's going on in the heart and the mind is very deep and very difficult. And the only way to have any hope of understanding uh, what's going on is through listening. Uh, and by the way, listening includes thoughtful questions, not leading questions, not obvious questions, just thoughtful questions, trying to understand their thought processes and how they got to where they are. It also means acknowledging legitimate issues. Okay, there are legitimate issues. There are legitimate, like I said, there's legitimate intellectual questions that need to be addressed. There are. Um, but it also means being able to say what you believe. It also means being able to say what you will or won't do because of what you believe. And also means you might have to be willing to be uh, misunderstood and have somebody angry at you. No matter how calm or gracious you may be, that hap may happen. The third thing they need is respect. Young adults, Christians, young adults, period, uh, they, they want and they demand to be treated with respect. And well, they should because they're adults, right? And so, and they resent being talked down to. They resent being treated as anything less than adults. So that means we need to take their concerns and their objections very seriously. We don't want to diminish them or, uh, or push them off. And that also means um, we don't take a defensive stance. There's something called a fortress mentality, okay, where when someone comes at you with some sort of threatening question or accusation about the Bible or God, you kind of just, well, let's just put the walls up and give them your best aggressive answer. That's, that, that doesn't communicate respect. Respect says, well, that's a good question. Let's talk about that. It may mean, let me think about that. Let me, let me do some work on that. That's a good question. That, that, that shows respect. Okay. Another one is truth and wisdom. Okay. Whether they know it or not, if you're trying to walk away from the living God and the Holy Scriptures, you're in desperate need of wisdom. Now, they don't know that, okay, but they need that. But wisdom and truth need to be presented, presented very carefully. Uh, and by that, um, and, and also, let me say that, and also in the context, see, see loving, listening, respect, see, all those things set the table for being able to speak truth. You've earned the right to speak truth. Right? So, but when we, when we speak truth, we need to be timely, we need to be careful, we need to be wise. And some of it's very just, just nuanced. If you, have some, if you have a young person who's struggling with the Bible, when you tell them the truth of the scripture, you don't need to quote the verse word for word and give the chapter and verse. The chapter and verse means nothing to them. It's not even inspired, by the way. Do you know that? Okay. Okay. Just the words. Just the words are inspired by God. Okay. Chapter and verse, those are added later. Okay. Just, just give them the truth of the word. You may not even need to share the whole verse. Share the part of the verse that pierces, that addresses directly what they need. Sometimes it means you simply say, well, let me, let me just, you give them wisdom, and it's from Scripture, but they don't even know it. And you say, well, here's a couple of thoughts for your consideration. And you share those thoughts, and you say, well, think about it. Just give it some thought. Right? See, again, that's mutual respect. That's treating them like an adult. Right? But it's also getting truth to them, making them deal with truth on some level and not, uh, hopefully not just rejecting it out of hand. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and it also means um, that you may simply address one issue and leave the rest go. That You may have a, a very painful, disturbing conversation with your son or daughter, and, you, and they've, got, they've got six things they're talking about. Well, don't take all six of them on. Take one or two. Right? Just, just again, be, be, ask God for wisdom about how do I engage this person so that maybe a dialogue can go on, maybe it won't. But if it doesn't go on, it won't be because of me and my attitude and my response. Right? And by the way, also, sometimes you need to do your, own, do your homework. Sometimes you'll find a young person struggling with something that you, don't, you never struggled with or you don't know anything about. And so then you've got to do some work and just acknowledge that. Say, well, you know, I, I don't know a lot about this. Let me, let me do some work on it now. What, can we talk again? That kind of thing. Okay. The fifth thing they need is a mentor. Everybody needs a mentor. I don't care if you're young or old. I've had three or four mentors in my life, uh, and I don't know where I'd be if I hadn't had those mentors at key times in my life. Uh, no one's more formative in a child's life than a parent. No one can replace the importance and the impact of mom and dad. But when they become adults, they need another voice in their life. Uh, they need a voice uh, 
that can see things, say things, and do things that you can't see, say, or do. Uh, they need a place to talk to an, someone who's older than them. How much older depends on the situation. Who's safe, who's wise, uh, and who believes in them. And, who can, and from whom they can share whatever they need to share and get a fresh perspective from them. A sounding board that will listen and provide guidance and understanding. Those people are out there. Pray for, I've been praying for mentors for my children for years and years. And you know what? Two years ago, one showed up in one of my son's life. And he showed up in the most amazing, unexpected, and somewhat disturbing way, right? But he showed up. And he is able to hear things that I don't get to hear. He's able to say things that I don't get to say. And you know what? He sees things in my son that I don't see. And sometimes he tells me about it, and that helps me, okay? So pray for a mentor. I've joked, I say, you know, hey, I mentor other people's kids. God, I need somebody to mentor my kids because they can do things that we cannot do. So pray for God to bring an, an adult believer who's older and wise and solid who just comes into their life. And for whatever reason, they receive them even though there's, they have this, you know, this mentor has the same beliefs that you have, right? So that's a big deal. Pray for that. And then the last thing is prayer. It's a spiritual battle for the minds and hearts of a whole generation. Um, and it needs to be approached in that way. You know, we say we believe in prayer, and oftentimes we only pray when we have to pray. The Apostle Paul, I'm amazed at how often he talks about the need and the power of prayer to rescue, to protect, and transform. Isn't that what we need? To rescue, to protect, and transform. That's what prayer does. So we need to pray. Need to move along here? Uh, so that's what the, the things that they need, all right? Now, what do you need, particularly as a parent? Or if you're, an, if you're uh, well, yeah, let's, let's just stick with that, okay? Let, particularly as a parent. Um, first of all, you need a place to share, a place to share your heart with people who love and care for you and have compassion for you. Uh, and, often, and it may be people who are going through the same thing that you're going through, and you find a kindred spirit that you can journey with. And in that sharing, you need a place where you can cry and where you can laugh, where you can let the pain out. And by pain, I'm just going to read it. The feelings of failure, confusion, anger, frustration, and being misunderstood. Right? You know, at, uh, a, while, a while back, uh, we, Karen and I were meeting with some good friends, and we were talking about this subject, and I, I asked the woman, I said, so who do you talk to about this? And she had the, uh, the most despairing look on her face. And she said, nobody, not on this level, nobody. That's where you don't want to be. And she's not there now, okay? She's in a very different place, and there are people in her life, and she's in their life, and it's a very different story. But see, alone as a couple or, or as one person dealing with particularly a child that way, that's, that's not where you want to be. You need to be in a place where you can share and where you can cry, and where you can laugh. By the way, there's always a place for dark humor. I'm sorry. That part of how you, that's a survival skill, right? It's just saying. Uh, and the last thing is where you can pray together. God has allowed this to come upon you, and, he's, and, he's, and he wants us to seek his face, and we need to do it intentionally, we need to do it individually, and we need to do it with other people. We need to believe God together for our children and keep knocking on the door of heaven. Again, let me reference Timothy Keller. He says this in his book on prayer. He says, we need to be audaciously assertive with God. We need to become, come boldly into the throne room as sons and daughters of the king and boldly ask him. In this case, ask him for your children or ask him for this young adult that you're working with or concerned about. Then he says, but that has to be coupled with a restful submissiveness. So be audacious, be assertive with God, tell him exactly what you need boldly, but then, having poured that out to him, then step back in restful submission and trust the sovereign, loving, all-wise, all-powerful God to do the right thing, to do it the right way and the right time. And keep doing that over and over and over again. Be intentional about that. Find people you can do that. Schedule that. Do it. 
Uh, Lori Tester, she's starting a group called Deepest Waters. It's about deep pain of any kind. I think that starts tomorrow night in the East Building. That's a place for women, okay, to come in whatever pain you're in, because this is, this is just one kind of pain, right? So that's an opportunity right here at Covenant that's just now opening up, right? Uh, let me just wrap up this way with, with some perspective. Um, first of all, proper assessment. If you are a parent of an adult child who is running away from God, uh, you need to understand, first of all, every parent makes mistakes. When I was first having kids, I remember my goal, this is just laughable, was to parent without regret. That's just a joke. <laughs> just, that may be the dumbest thing I ever said. Okay? You, regret and parenting go together just look, because mistakes and parenting go together. We all make mistakes. Now, proper assessment is this. Take responsibility for what you're responsible for. If you've made mistakes with your children, and I'm speaking not theoretically here, okay? I'm think, speaking personally. There's a place for a profound, heartfelt, significant apology, maybe more than once, followed by life change, okay? You know, John the Baptist, repent and do the deeds of repentance, okay? Repentance is life change. So taking responsibility for, what you're, for the mistakes you've made and apologizing for them and then whatever that behavior or decision, what, then changing that or, and or making amends for it, depending on what it is, right? That's a very powerful tool, a very important tool. And then stop there and see what the, what the struggle is for parents in this situation is we begin to take responsibility for things that we are not responsible for, like our adult children's adult choices. And when we begin to do that, that'll take us down a dark road, and at the end of that road is guilt, depression, and despair. That will not help you. It's very important, and sometimes you need counsel as, as to how, what a proper assessment is. I love, again, I'm, this is a Timothy Keller day. I love Timothy Keller. In one of his books, he said, when, I, when we went to start a church in New York City, I had three young, wild boys, and one of their aunts told my wife, said, don't move to New York City. They'll be in a gang by the end of the month. Okay? And then Keller says, he said, that was 20-some years ago. He said, my sons are all grown. They're all walking with God. He said, but here's the deal. He said, there are men in my church who are better fathers, were and are, than I ever was and am now. And they have at least one child or maybe all their children are walking with God. He said, you know what that is? He said, I've been given grace. Grace is unmerited and undeserved. And what they need is grace. They need to give themselves grace. We need to give them grace because God gives grace, right? So a proper assessment. And you have to work that out. You probably need to work that out with at least one other person, which goes back to what I'd said before. All right, quickly. Uh, your life example matters. Real faith, life-changing faith is very, very difficult to explain away. Uh, in spite of the best efforts of your children, right? So don't give up and don't let discouragement erode your witness, right? Um, and don't buy everything they say. Sometimes they're just trying stuff out on you, um, just to see, you know? Uh, sometimes they're blaming you for things that you're not responsible for because people love to blame. Um, sometimes they're lashing out at you because you represent righteousness and truth. And I can tell you from experience, a rebellious, sinful believer trying to get away from God hates to see examples of righteousness and truth. And so just by showing up in the doorway, they can be angry with you, all right? So keep that in mind. Um, I just try not to take it personally, I guess is what I'm saying, right? Uh, the next thing, and almost done here. The story is not over till it's over. The last page has yet to be written. Uh, we're on a journey with God, and they are on a journey with God, and they belong to him. And remember, they're just trying to get away. Because you see, if you've trusted Christ as Savior when you're young, that means you've been bought with a price, and you're not your own. You've been, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, and you belong to God. Now, there's a kind of a clean clinical uh, approach to Christianity that says, well, you know, if you're really a believer... You're walking with God and you'd never twist off like that and have those problems and have those doubts and have those stances that you're taking and, those, and, the, and the lifestyle that you're living. Okay, well, that's real simple and clean and clinical. 
And you know, then if, so if you're not doing that, if, if, if you're not walking with God and you're doing this, then that means you were never saved. Well, is that the truth sometimes? Yes, sometimes that's true, right? But you know the truth is most of the time? <laughs> they belong to God. They trust God. There, this one mom I, I talked to recently, she said, and all three of their children are struggling spiritually. And she said, I was there. I saw them pray. I saw their hearts. I heard their words. I was there when they trusted Christ. And I said, then you stick with that because that's the truth. And just because they're out in left field right now doesn't mean they don't belong to God. So be very, very careful about taking that stance with someone or with your own kids, all right? Let me give you one other example. In our men's group, we've been sharing life stories. And it's interesting because there's 12 of us and they fall in two, most of us has fallen in two categories. One is guys who are unbelievers and came to faith in their 20s, 30s, 40s, and even 50s. And what happened? God tracked them down, he ran them down, and then he overwhelmed them, and they came to faith, right? The other group is the group that I'm in. We came to faith when we were young, had real struggles with God, and what did God do? He tracked us down, he ran us down, and he overwhelmed us. And we're all there. And with one exception, we're all in our 40s, 50s, and 60s. Right? The story is not over till it's over. The last page has not been written. So don't act like it has because it has not. And so when God moves, sometimes he moves unbelievably suddenly, which means me my last point. Your hope, our hope, is in God. It's not in yourself. It's not in your children. It's not in your circumstances. This has not taken God by surprise. He's not at a loss at what to do. He doesn't lack power. These, these young people belong to him, and he knows exactly what to do, what he's going to do, when he's going to do it, and how he's going to do it. And when he moves, if you've ever seen this, and I have, when God moves, it's amazing how all these powerful walls and barriers and arguments and behaviors, how they just simply collapse in a heap when he moves, because he is powerful. Very, very powerful. So we need to remember that. And remember that God is doing a work of grace in us, and he's doing a work of grace in our children. And it's, and it's fruit, and it's value, and it's worthiness will stretch all the way into eternity. I hope I've left you with hope, because we need to be a hopeful, faith-filled people a praying people for this generation, whether or not you're personally affected by it, either by a friendship or by someone you're trying to reach into their life or as a parent. Either way, we need to pray for this younger generation. They are being challenged in ways that we never were. So let's do that. Let's pray, all right? Father, thank you for this time. Lord, I pray first for people here who have friends, uh, who have people they're trying to help, but most of all, I pray for parents, Father, that you give courage that you'd give wisdom, that you'd give faith and hope and help and healing and grace, Father, from the inside out. Give them all they need, Lord, to walk this difficult road that they find themselves walking and do a work of power and grace in them first and then do a work of power and grace in their children, Father, one by one. Track them down. Run them down and then overwhelm them with your power and your grace and your truth and your love. Pray these things in Jesus' name.